the king of my heart be the mountain where I run the fountain I drink from oh he is my song let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide the ransom for my life oh he is my
John chapter 14 is where we're going to start. Uh, then we'll go back to chapter 7 in a few minutes. But we are studying the, the gospel of John. We're calling this study, Taking a Fresh Look at Jesus. And today, as we finish chapter 7, our message title is Taking a Fresh Look at Jesus' Successor. We'll be talking about the person and the work of the Holy Spirit today. And um, before we dig in to the text, I, I want to remind you of a few things that we learned last week as we looked at the first 36 verses in this chapter. The time markers in this chapter tell us that it's about six months before Jesus' upcoming arrest and crucifixion and death on the cross. At the same time, the time markers at the beginning of John chapter 7 remind us that the opposition towards Jesus from the religious leadership in the nation of Israel was quickly intensifying. And in response to that, Jesus has been saying some very specific things to his disciples. And I think Mark does a great job of summing up what Jesus said in chapter 9, verse 31. Jesus, or Mark writes, he says, For Jesus taught his disciples and said to them, the Son of Man, that's a messianic title that Jesus often used of himself. He said, the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And after he is killed, he will rise the third day. Jesus is reminding his disciples that he is here on a mission. And that mission is to solve mankind's greatest problem. Every human being that came into this world suffered from something that Adam and Eve did in the Garden of Eden. When they rebelled against the Lord, they fell into a condition called sin. Adam and Eve had children. That next generation were sinners. They had children. That generation were sinners. Right down to you and I. Every human being that was ever born was born under the curse of sin and Romans 5 says that because sin entered the world through a man, sin would have to be reconciled by a man. And there's a problem with that, is it would take a sinless man to reconcile the human race to their creator, and guess what there has never been upon the face of the earth? A sinless human being. And so the father solves this. He looks at his son and he, before eternity even began. And... He asks God the Son, Jesus, to take on a second nature and to come to earth. So Jesus added humanity to his deity. He came to earth, and as God, he was able to live a perfect life in our place. As a man, he was able to die a substitutionary death in our place. And as Jesus bore the sin of all mankind on the cross, he went into the grave. On the third day, he came out, and sin and death were conquered. And so as we've been reading in the Gospel of John, anybody who recognizes their sin, puts their faith in the finished work of Jesus, and trusts him as their Savior, they will be forgiven. We say saved. Sometimes we say born again. Now, to, to you and I, isn't that the most amazing news? I am so thankful that Jesus came, and I'm so thankful that he carried my sin to the cross. But I want you to put yourself in the the position of his disciples and, and especially his 12 apostles. They can't see the theological truths of the future because they are blinded by the fact that he just said, I'm leaving you. And they're thinking, we've spent three and a half years devoting our lives to you. We have become your little entourage. We're your followers. We're your people. And you're what? You're leaving us? And Jesus then has to speak to them and say, it's actually better for you if I go. And I want to read to you the words that John recorded because as they can't think of anything but how horrible this is that Jesus is leaving, he makes them this beautiful promise and this promise actually will impact you and I today as well. Look at John 14 verse 16. Jesus says, I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever, the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him, 
but you, he's talking to his followers, he's even talking to you and I, you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. And then verse 18, I, I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. And so Jesus promises it's good that I go away because when I go away, shortly after, I'm going to send my Holy Spirit to you. And he's going to be with you. He's going to live in you. And, and we're going to talk about those things today. So now flip over to John 7. And on the heels of what we just read, I want to read you our key verses for the day. And then we'll dig into this text. But John records these words in, in verses 37 through 39 of John chapter 7. Let me read this to you. He, he says, on the last day, that great day of the feast... Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. And then John gives us some commentary. He explains. He says, This he spoke concerning the Holy Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. John says, after Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, the Holy Spirit would come. And he's explaining that. So let me pray, and then we're going to dig into this text. Father, we are thankful that we have this time to come and to sit in your presence as your word is read and taught. We're talking about the Holy Spirit today, the person, the work of the Holy Spirit and Lord, we're going to look at 17 verses, and in these 17 verses, there will be something for every person in this room to not only relate to, but to respond to. So Lord, let your spirit be our teacher today, and let us be open to what he teaches us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I'm going to overstate the obvious. I've already been saying it, but... Here in John chapter 7, John is introducing his audience to the person and the work of the Holy Spirit. Now, I've been in the church long enough to see that within the church, there are a lot of different opinions about the Holy Spirit. On one side, on the far side, you have a group that I would label as the misinformed. By misinformed, I'm talking about a group that we would probably call hyper-charismatic. They overemphasize the supernatural work of the Holy Spirit, and they pursue unbiblical experiences that they attribute to the Holy Spirit. Who remembers the 90s when Benny Hinn used to mow people down with the Holy Spirit machine gun? And people would fall backwards. Search the scriptures. You will not find the Holy Spirit machine gun in the scriptures. And so one of the things that happens is that people who have been unexposed to church go to a church like this and they leave with their eyes about this big and they go, I don't want nothing to do with this Jesus stuff, right? And then on the other side, you've got the uninformed. We would probably call this group the hyper-fundamentalists and they've responded to the hyper-charismatics by completely ignoring what the Bible says about the person and the work of the Holy Spirit. Now, I talk about the Lord everywhere I go, and I talk about the Holy Spirit regularly because he's a regular part of my life. And every once in a while, I'll be talking to a Christian, and I will use those two cuss words, the Holy Spirit, and someone will go, Whoo! they freak, that's not a cuss word, that was a joke. When you're talking to someone who doesn't understand the Holy Spirit, they come from this hyper-fundamentalist background, you say the words Holy Spirit, and they flip. They're like, Pastor Randy's going to pop me on the forehead and expect me to fall backwards, right? What we have in common with the misinformed and the uninformed are we have two groups of people who have formed an opinion about the Holy Spirit, but not based on biblical truth. Their view of the person and the work of the Holy Spirit is usually extra biblical. And so one of the blessings about being a church like a Calvary Chapel is that as we go verse by verse, chapter by chapter, and book by book, from Genesis to Revelation, and then we do it again, and then we do it again, we get a very balanced and biblical understanding of the person and the work of the Holy Spirit. 
and we trust him to work in our church and in our lives. Today, we're going to spend some time looking at what the Bible says about the person and work of, the, of Jesus' successor, the Holy Spirit. And since this is part two of a message we started last week, let's remind ourselves that these events took place, look at verse 37, at the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, when we use the word feast, we're just talking about a religious holiday. And in the fall of the year, the Jews celebrated the Feast of Tabernacles, and it commemorated God's faithfulness to the Jewish people over a period of 40 years when they left Egypt and they went to the Promised Land. This trip was only supposed to take a couple of weeks, but because of their rebellion, they had to go around and around and around until that entire generation died. And during those 40 years, God was faithful. He loved them. He provided them manna for food, and he provided them water. And if you remember, that water came out of a rock. That is highly symbolic. Jesus is the rock of our salvation, and from him comes forth the Holy Spirit. It's a beautiful illustration. Notice verse 37 on the last day, that great day of the feast. And so the feast lasted eight days. And for the first seven days, a priest would take a golden pitcher, he would leave the temple. He would go down the hill into the old city of David where there was a place called the Pool of Siloam. He would fill up his pitcher with water out of the pool. He would go all the way back up to the temple with hundreds or even thousands of people following him. And as they got back to the temple, right in front of the altar, he would pour out the water that he had drawn while the crowd quoted Isaiah 12:3 up on the screen. Therefore, with joy... You will draw water from the wells of salvation. And as the priest poured out this water, he would remind the people that what they were remembering is God's faithfulness to provide water in the desert for 40 years. But on the last day of the feast, it's probably the eighth day, as the water was poured out, the priest would then add Isaiah 44, 3, for I will pour water on him who is thirsty and floods on the dry ground. I will pour my spirit on your descendants and my blessings on your offspring. Now look at verse 37, because as the priest and the people stop, or, or they finish quoting Isaiah 44, 3, notice Jesus stood and cried out, saying, and I want to pause again. The priest and the people finish quoting Isaiah 44, 3, and Jesus stands, and, and the key words here are cried out. Like, I have a microphone and a sound system. Jesus didn't have that. He's got a crowd gathered, and he knows that in six months, he's going to be arrested and killed. This is probably one of his very last opportunities to address a crowd of this size at one of the religious gatherings. So he knows this is the time. This is, this is the time. I've got to speak. And he cries out, and notice what he says. He says, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. And then again, John says that he spoke this concerning the Holy Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. And so, let me just summarize what we just read. Then we're going to study the rest of the chapter. Then we're going to come back and we're going to camp out on these three verses and talk about the person and the work of the Holy Spirit. So, in summary, Jesus, he says to this crowd, in the same way that the Father in heaven provided water to satisfy your physical thirst, your, your forefathers' physical thirst, as they went through the desert for 40 years, Jesus says, he has now sent me to come and to satisfy your deepest spiritual needs. And he says, I will restore your broken relationship with your creator. And then... I will fill this empty void in your heart that you try to fill with religion or sinful practices. And then he says, after that, I'm going to flow forth from you to the world around you. And just as you are refreshed by me, Jesus says, I'm going to use you to refresh others. Have I wet your appetite for the person and the work of the Holy Spirit? So with that, I'm going to leave you hanging while we study the rest of the text, and then we will come back to this. But I want to show you in verses 40 through 43 how Jesus' words divided the crowd. And this, to me, is a perfect example of how different groups of people can hear the exact 
same word of God and have completely different perspectives of what was said. Look at verse 40. He says, therefore, many from the crowd, when they heard this saying, said, truly, this is the prophet. And others said, yes, this is the Christ. And so this first group that we're reading about here, they obviously knew the Old Testament scriptures. They knew the Old Testament scriptures so well that when they saw Jesus and, and as they heard him making these statements about living water and such, they realized this is the promised Messiah. He's the one that Moses and the prophets promised to us. But what I want you to see is that they filtered Jesus' words through their knowledge of the Old Testament scriptures. When they heard him speak, they recognized this is the one. Let's go on to a different group of people, middle of verse 41. Some said, will the Christ come out of Galilee? Has not the scripture said that the Christ comes from the seed of David and from the town of Bethlehem where David was? Now, tune into something here. This second group of people They knew their Old Testament Bible well enough to see and to know that the Messiah was going to come out of Bethlehem. But what they were ignorant about was Jesus. They're looking at him. Nobody took the time to go get to know him or do research about him. They just basically said, hey, we know our Bible well enough to know that Messiah comes from Bethlehem. Jesus just came down from Galilee And so this can't be the Messiah. Nobody went and just talked to him and said, hey, uh, Jesus, you're very controversial, so we want to ask you a couple of questions. Where were you born? If they would have simply done that, he could have cleared things up. What they did is they had a knowledge of the scriptures, but they filtered Jesus' words through ignorance. And what they did is they rejected him. This still happens today, and at the risk of offending someone, I I don't want to offend anybody, but sometimes once we're offended, we're able to actually hear truth. And so let me say some words, let me be bold enough to say that there may be someone here in this room, there may be somebody watching online today, and you've been exploring Christianity, you've been trying to learn about Jesus. And someone maybe invited you to church today, invited you to church last week or whatever it was, and you're, you're hearing more and more. You've actually maybe even read your Bible. You're getting some Bible knowledge, and you're starting to be convinced that Jesus is the Savior. And you're almost ready to believe in him and, and trust him. But you're at this place where you're like, you know what? I'm ready to receive Jesus if somebody can just answer a couple of my really hard questions. Number one, where the heck did Cain get his wife? If you answer me that, I'll accept your Jesus, right? And this one, how in the world did a snake speak to Eve in the Garden of Eden when serpents don't have vocal cords? Answer me that, right? And maybe you start answering, and then they go, oh, 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 you know what else? This is a third one. I need you to answer this one, too. I started reading my Old Testament, and it's pretty clear that the God of the Bible supports slavery. And you're like, man, you didn't read far enough. You only read a little bit. You, you, you got right. And so what you do is you start to try to answer these questions. And in, in my experience, over many years of talking to people, I've noticed that no matter how good an answer I give, it's never good enough. And when I answer this question, they have three more. The reason why is because they're filtering their understanding of Jesus through something other than humility and the word of God. And so I want to speak to anybody. If I'm describing you and you think that I'm saying this because the person that invited you to church today or asked you to tune in online sent me an email and said, PR, if you just say these words, I know my friend will get saved. That didn't happen. That didn't happen at all. This is just what the Holy Spirit is doing today, but I want to throw out a challenge. I'm going to invite you to put your questions aside and simply surrender to Jesus right now. And once you surrender to him, then start studying your Bible diligently. And what you're going to find is that over the next year or two, 
a lot of these questions that you have, you're going to actually get an answer from the scriptures. And some of the questions that you have, you may, you may never get answered. There are some hard questions, especially when people formulate questions. But I encourage you, surrender. And then the Lord will start answering your questions. But don't try to put God in like an arm bar and say, once you answer these questions, then I'll receive your son. He doesn't usually respond well to those kinds of threats. It would be better if you just received the Lord. Now look at verse 43. He says, so, so there was a division among the people because of him. You see, whenever you have a group of people filtering Jesus through the written word of God, and then you've got a group of people filtering Jesus through personal opinion or denominational uh, tradition or something like that, there is going to be division. And this crowd, they were devo- uh, divided. And, and then jump to verse 44. I want you to see that this division escalated towards detention. This crowd now, a bunch of them, they're very ignorant about Jesus. And the citizens that were in that place began to join the religious leaders in seeking to arrest Jesus. Look at verse 44. Now some of them, this is the divided crowd, they, they wanted to take him. And I want to pause there again. That phrase, take him, if you look at it in the Bible and in extra biblical writings and history, it's an interesting phrase that talks about like catching a fish or an imprisoning a person. So they wanted to go arrest Jesus and imprison him, but no one laid hands on him. And then the officers came to the chief priests and the Pharisees who said to them, why have you not brought him? And the officers answered, no man ever spoke like this man. Now, do you remember last week when we were going through the first half of this chapter, we got to verse 32 and the religious leaders sent a group of officers to go listen to Jesus. And their job was to listen to his teaching, try to find something blasphemous that he said so that they could then have grounds to arrest him. And so these guys come back and they don't have Jesus. And the religious leaders look at him and, and they er, look at these guys and they say, where's Jesus? You were supposed to arrest him. And I want notice their, their words. They said, uh, no man ever spoke like this man. I can imagine they just look and they say, you know, once we heard him speaking, we were ready to arrest him. And then we realized we are in the presence of greatness. In fact, the more we listened to him and the more we examined him, we became convinced that we were in the presence of Messiah himself. And there was no way we are going to arrest the Messiah. And this is where this gets really good. Verses 47 through 49 the religious leaders of Israel began to respond to these guys. And I want to pause here for a minute because as I was preparing this message, I felt this really strong impression from the Holy Spirit to talk about toxic spiritual leadership. Toxic spiritual leadership. We have an example here of a group of guys who had been entrusted with the oversight of an entire nation. They were the religious leaders of an entire nation, the the religious leaders of an entire religious system. And they are so focused on fulfilling an agenda, which at this time was arresting and killing Jesus, that they became toxic in the way that they led. Notice what they say here, verse 47. The Pharisees answered them. They're now speaking to, to their subordinates. And they say, are you also deceived? Have any of the rulers of the Pharisees believed in him? But this crowd that does not know the law is accursed. To put it simply, these religious leaders who just just think of, of, of modern day, these are the pastors and the elders and the overseers of a local church or high level leaders in a denomination or something like that. And they're speaking to their subordinates, to the people they're supposed to shepherd and love and lead and care for. And they basically say, listen, guys, we don't pay you to think for yourselves or to have an opinion about spiritual matters. No, we don't care what the citizens of Israel think about Jesus. 
our opinion of Jesus is the only one that matters, and if you won't arrest him, we'll fire you, and we'll find someone that'll do what we tell them to do. And what's interesting is if you jump ahead six months, that's exactly what happened. They found a group of men that they could pay a bribe to, and these men would lie about Jesus. They would fabricate a lie about Jesus. They found another group of men that would arrest him, and they were able to manipulate the governor, the Roman governor, to actually arrest, try, condemn, and crucify Jesus. It's pretty scary. We've all heard this phrase I'm going to quote in a minute, but I was going to quote it, and then I realized I don't know who said it. I wanted to research that. So I did a little bit of research, and I found out that a 19th century British politician named Lord Acton, he spoke this proverb. He says, power tends to corrupt, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And we are reading about a group of men that the Lord had entrusted to oversee the spiritual care of a nation. And these guys had just become extremely toxic. They had become prideful. They had become dangerous. And we'll touch on that again in a minute. But, but the next thing I want to show you as we finish our study of the text, we'll go back and, and look at our Holy Spirit verses in a minute. But we want to talk about how an undercover disciple defends Jesus. Notice verse 50. Nicodemus, who came to Jesus by night, being one of them. Let, let's just pause. You guys remember Nicodemus chapter 3? In chapter 3, we're reading, and, and this guy named Nicodemus, he is a member of the Jewish ruling council. He's one of the guys that I've just been talking about. He was part of the group called the Pharisees. And he comes to Jesus in a private meeting. He comes at night, and he says to Jesus, listen, there are some of us who have been examining you, and the works that you do have us convinced that you are a teacher sent by God. And Jesus just turns around and he says, you know, Nicodemus, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Jesus says to Nicodemus, listen, the only way that a person can be part of God's kingdom is they have to be, and he uses this phrase, born again. I've explained what it means to be born again, but I think it's important that we cover it again. I said it once this morning, we're all born physically alive, but spiritually dead because of our sin. When we confess our sin and we trust in Jesus' finished work on the cross to pay for our sin, God's Spirit, He comes and He lives in us. And He regenerates our dead spirit. He brings our dead spirit to life. And we have experienced now this spiritual birth. So we're physically alive and we're also now spiritually alive, heaven-bound, forgiven, and it is the most amazing experience to be born again. Amen, church? I mean, I just want to kind of just, have you ever had a hamburger so good that you had to call somebody like, oh my gosh, you got to go to this place. But what do you immediately do after you eat that hamburger? You make plans to go back there and eat that hamburger again. Agreed? And this time you're going to get a double. All right. When you are born again, something is very different. You are so, so fulfilled. This void that is inside of you is now full. And you don't ever wake up and go, man, I got born again by Jesus, but next week I'm going to explore Buddhism. And the week after that, Confuciusism. Then I'm going to become a Muslim. See, it doesn't work that way. You get born again. The Spirit of God comes and lives inside of you. And all of a sudden, you realize, I have been a dead man walking I'm finally alive, and I don't want anything but to exist in this place for the rest of my life. Somewhere along the line, after that John 3 meeting, Nicodemus gets born again. We don't know when it happened, but it appears he's born again at this point, and, and he's an undercover disciple. I don't think any of us in here should ever be undercover disciples, but it was necessary for him. He was a born-again follower of Jesus, but he was a member of the Sanhedrin, the ruling council. He had to kind of fly under the radar. 
And so notice he says to them, verse 51, does our, law, does our law judge a man before it hears him and knows what he's doing? He's quoting Deuteronomy chapter 1 and other Old Testament scriptures that basically say if a person's accused of a crime, he needs to get a fair hearing without being condemned first. And Nicodemus looks at his peers and he says, these guys are so determined to kill Jesus that they're willing to set aside the word of God. They're willing to break God's law in order to go after Jesus. And this is something that you see in toxic spiritual leaders. They begin to justify bad behavior because it enables them to reach a specific goal. In this case, it was kill Jesus. Sometimes toxic leaders are like, listen, we've got to grow the church at, at any, you know, any cost. And so they begin getting involved in unspiritual things. But I want to show you how toxic leaders respond to biblical correction. Look at verse 52. They answered and said to him, Are you also from Galilee? Search and look, for no prophet has arisen out of Galilee. Now, to you and I as Western readers, we're like, huh, that's interesting. But let me kind of tell you two things that, if you understand the culture, really bring out what they were doing. The first thing is they, they personally insult him. How many of you come from a state where there's that one city or town that everybody makes fun of? You know, it's, oh, you're from where? <laughs> right? But one time on a Sunday morning, I was illustrating this, and I talked about a town in northern New Mexico that we all in New Mexico used to make fun of, and we all had a good laugh in here until after the service when a lady visiting for the first time walked straight back to me and she goes, I'm from that town. I was eating crow. I just sat back there and told her, I am so sorry. She goes, well, it is the town everybody makes fun of. Your state probably has one of those, right? Galilee, if you were from Galilee, you were looked down upon by the people in Judea because the people in Judea were well-educated. They were cultured. They looked at the people of Galilee. Please forgive me if this doesn't come across the way it's supposed to, but like hillbillies. Thank you. Okay. They're basically saying, Nicodemus, are, just a, are you dumb hillbilly? Do you know anything, right? They personally insult him. I have noticed that when you're dealing with toxic leaders, even spiritual leaders, even if you give them a biblical correction, they will show you whether they're teachable and humble or not by the way they respond. And if they come back with a, are you a dumb hillbilly? Okay, you realize you're dealing with a toxic leader, unteachable. Second thing they do is they accuse him of being biblically ignorant. Notice they go, no prophet comes from Galilee. Search the scriptures, you'll find that no prophet comes from Galilee. And I'm gonna give them the benefit of the doubt. I think what they meant is search the scriptures and you'll find that Messiah doesn't come from Galilee. That probably fits better, but that's not what they said. And if you go back and you search the scriptures, do you know that you can find four, at least four prophets in the Old Testament that came from Galilee? And so again, they're, they're, they're going to win a fight at any cost. Toxic leadership. But I love it here. We'll look at verse 53. Nicodemus' intervention here seemed to be the turning point in this conflict. Look, and everyone, verse 53, went to his own house. As we read at the beginning of the chapter, John said Jesus' time had not yet come. That was still six months down the road. And whatever God was going to use to keep Jesus from being arrested now, and put in jail now, he could have used anything. But he appears to have used the boldness of Nicodemus to stand up and say, wait a minute, guys. We are men of the word. And we are going to conduct ourselves according to the word. And God used Nicodemus to just kind of stop this conflict. So what we've done is we've covered the rest of the chapter. And now in the few minutes that we have left, I want to talk to you about the person and the work of the Holy Spirit. 
And I want to go back to verses 37 through 39. I must tell you, this will in no way be an exhaustive study on the person and the work of the Holy Spirit. But I've done entire series on the work of the Holy Spirit. You can find them on our YouTube channel or on our website. But what this will be is I promise you this will be applicable. And every person in this room right now and everybody watching online is going to be able to relate for the next couple of minutes. Not only will you be able to relate to everything I say, you're going to have to make a decision and you're going to have to respond regarding the Holy Spirit. So go back here to verse 39 and you'll remember that one of the verses quoted as the priest poured out the water for those first seven days, the people would quote Isaiah 12, 3. Therefore, with joy, you will draw water from the wells of salvation. Now look at Jesus' words. What does he say? He says, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Jesus is saying here, I am the well of salvation. I've come to restore your relationship with your creator. And I want you to notice that he immediately gives an invitation to receive salvation. What is salvation? Salvation is being forgiven of our sins and having our relationship restored to the Lord. And I want you to see that Jesus gives us this invitation in a broad sense. One of the questions I want to ask is, who was invited to receive salvation? There's a a theological position out there that says that God has only chosen some people to be saved and other peoples he he has chosen to, to suffer eternal punishment. That is not what the scriptures teach. In fact, look, Jesus himself, he says, if anyone, and I want to just pause with that. Jesus gives this invitation to receive salvation, and he says, anyone can come to me to receive salvation. He invites everyone to be saved, but I want to show you that he also gives conditions by which a person can be saved. Notice three conditions that have to be met to receive salvation. The first is you have to thirst And that thirst is talking about recognizing that you have a need. In this case, it is recognizing the need to have your sin forgiven and to have your broken relationship with your creator restored. Second condition, he says, come to me and drink. He's describing the process of making a decision to respond by faith to Jesus' invitation to forgive your sin. And to restore your relationship with the Lord. So God desires that all men would be saved. But then he puts the choice in our lap. Whoever will come. And I want to share that when you do this. When when you make the decision to receive Christ as your savior and be forgiven. Some very interesting thing happens. We describe them with theological terms, but I'm just going to give you all the the, the layman's terms. Uh, I want you to kind of use a banking illustration. Your Heavenly Father looks at you as, as an unsaved human being, and he looks at your bank account, and he realizes that you are spiritually bankrupt. In fact, you are so far in debt, you could never get out. And the Father says, I have a solution for this. What do you want? And you say, I I thirst. And I want to come to Jesus and be forgiven. And the father reaches over into Jesus' bank account, his spiritual bank account, and he makes a wire transfer and he dumps the righteousness of Jesus Christ into your bank account. And now your bank account is overflowing with the righteousness of Jesus Christ. The moment you ask for forgiveness and you're forgiven, the theological term is you've been justified by faith. It's just as if you never sinned. And then his righteousness is imputed to you. That's him taking the righteousness of Jesus and dumping it in your bank account. And you go, hey, I didn't earn that. And God goes, exactly. You can't earn it. It's a free gift. Second thing that happens is that the moment that you pray to receive Jesus as your Savior... The third person of the Holy Trinity, the Holy Spirit, he takes up residence in you. And let me tell you why. Before you were saved, you were a dirty vessel. You were overwhelmed with sin. 
You were immersed in sin. But when you were forgiven, now you're a clean vessel. And the Holy Spirit goes, hey, I want to live in that clean vessel. And he comes and he resides in you. Your dead spirit is now brought to life. You have been born again. Go on and, and read with me. We'll move towards verse 38. But on the last day of the feast... As the priest and the people are coming back up the hill and the priest is pouring out that final pitcher of water, they would quote Isaiah 44, 3, I will pour out water on him who is thirsty and floods on the dry ground. I will pour my spirit on your descendants and my blessing on your offspring. And at that moment, as the priest and the people stop speaking, the words of Isaiah, Jesus says, he who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Literally, it's out of his heart will gush torrents of living water. And Jesus is now saying, after I save you, my spirit will come and live within you. And for a period of time, you're going to be like a reservoir. And that reservoir it is the work of the Spirit in your life where you are being transformed. Your mind is being transformed. Your life is being transformed. Your actions are changing. Your thought life is changing. You are a whole new person. But here's the interesting thing. Have you ever been out hiking and you come across a little pool of water and you're like, oh, thank God, something to drink. And as you reach down to scoop, you realize there's little things living in there and it's kind of stinky. You've done that, right? You only want to drink out of flowing streams when you're hiking. If you don't know that, that's why you got a stomach ache that day. <laughs> this is what happens to so many Christians. They get saved. The Holy Spirit comes to live within them, and they're like, this is amazing. I'm just going to sit home and watch Christian TV and watch all of Calvary Chapel Greer's services online every day. I'm never even going to go through the building again. It's all about me and Jesus. And after a while... That starts to stink. And the Lord says, listen, that's not what I created you for. Once my spirit lives in you and he is transforming you, I'm then going to include you in my plan to reach this world. We call it the Great Commission. And the Lord is going to have a time in your personal life where his spirit begins to fill you to overflowing. And out of you will gush forth those torrents of living water. And you will begin to be the one that shares the gospel and quenches the spiritual thirst of other people and ministers to them. You see, Jesus didn't call you to be a reservoir of his spirit. He called you to be a flowing fountain of his spirit. Now, what I want to do is end this study by having you turn back to John 14. You were there once. I want to show you Three Greek prepositions used in the New Testament to describe the Holy Spirit's role in our lives. Every person in here is going to be able to gauge where you are by where you fit into this explanation. You'll see as we go along. In John 14, verse 16, Jesus says, I'll, I'll pray to the Father and he will give you another helper that he, pause there for a minute, please notice that the Holy Spirit is a person. He's not a force. He's not an it. He is a person, the third person of the Trinity. He will abide with you forever. Verse 17, he calls him the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him or knows him, but you. Those of you who follow me, Jesus says, you know him for he dwells with you and he will be in you. I will not leave you orphans. I will come upon you. Here in verse 17, there's two prepositions that describe the Holy Spirit's relationship with human beings. And the first is that word with. He dwells with you. The Greek preposition is para. It describes coming alongside, and since the moment you were born, the Holy Spirit has been beside you and he's been guiding you and when the time was just right when he has your heart perfectly prepared he started pointing you to Jesus all the new employees at work are those crazy Christians your new next door neighbor is a crazy Christian everywhere you go some weird guy like Pastor Randy wants to talk about Jesus right that is the Holy Spirit coming alongside you to point you to your Savior Jesus 
And the response is that then you would say, okay, I'm confessing my sin, I'm receiving forgiveness. Then we get to that next word. It says he dwells with you and will be in you. That Greek preposition is en, E-N. English, in. It, it means literally inside. When you put your faith in the finished work of Jesus, your sin is erased, you become a clean vessel, the Holy Spirit comes and lives inside you, you begin to be transformed. You're just a different person. There's some people in this room today and you're at the in stage. I'm sorry, you're at the para stage. You, you know the Holy Spirit's just been hounding you. He's talking to you about Jesus all the time. He doesn't want to leave you there. He wants you to move to the second stage preposition here in he, he wants you to be saved he wants to live inside of you but there is a third found in Acts chapter 1 8 look just look at the screen don't turn there we're running out of time Jesus says you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth that word upon the Greek preposition is epi and it means to fill, to overflowing, to, to be engulfed. Jesus used the phrase, he says, you will be baptized in the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Think about when a person's baptized in water. They are immersed in water. When you are filled with the Holy Spirit, you are immersed in the Holy Spirit, and he's upon you, he's flowing out of you, and he's using you to lead other people to the Savior. He's teaching you to share the gospel, to make disciples. He shows you what your spiritual gifts are and what your place is in the life and the ministry of the local church. Now up to this point, we've just had a Bible study. But for the next few minutes, just before the worship team leads us in our closing song, I just want to address you I'm not going to pull any punches. Last service, we had two or three people get saved and receive the Lord. If you are here right now and you are not forgiven, you are in the para stage. The Holy Spirit is next to you. He's trying to guide you to Jesus. And if I may be so bold, if you recognize that that's going on, today is the day you need to stop resisting and you need to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You need to acknowledge that your sin is separating you from your Savior, but that putting your faith in Him will be the solution to that. So I'll just do what I did last service. If there's anybody here and right now you want to be saved, be bold enough to put up your hand and just say, I want to meet Jesus. Oh, I have to do what I used to do in the past. Oh, good. Hands are going up. Good. Now I don't have to pretend and go, oh, I see you in the back. Oh, yes, I see you in the parking lot. Okay. Okay, some hands. Some hands going up. People want to receive Jesus as Savior. So what do you do? You say, Lord, I'm a sinner. I can't do anything about that sin. I need a Savior. His name is Jesus, the Jesus of the Bible, and I right now want to be saved. And guess what? You're saved. You've put your faith in his finished work. You've trusted in him. Your sin is forgiven. His spirit now lives inside of you. In fact, that brings us to the second group. If you're saved... You're in the end stage, E-N, the Holy Spirit. He lives in you. He's transforming you. So your job is to cooperate with him. Spend time in the word. Spend time in prayer. Get involved in a small group. Do anything you can to cultivate your spiritual growth. But every believer needs to ask this question. Have I experienced epi? Have I experienced what Jesus called the baptism of the Holy Spirit, where you go from being a reservoir of God's grace to being a flowing fountain of God's grace that from your innermost being gushes forth torrents of living water. This is where you get involved in Jesus' plan to make disciples of the entire world. It's where you get in touch with your spiritual gifts. You find where you fit in the local church, and you actually become part of the process of fulfilling the Great Commission. And if there's anybody that wants to just receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I would just say, pop your hand up. Do you want to do Christianity on your own, or do you want to do Christianity with supernatural power from on high? I pray on a daily basis to receive 
the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the refilling of the Holy Spirit every single day. In fact, multiple times a day. Multiple times a day. Father, we have looked at your word. We've studied the rest of this chapter. We've talked about the person of the Holy Spirit. We've talked about the ministry and the work of the Spirit. Today, Lord, we we had some people who put up their hands. They want to receive Christ as Savior. Be with them. Start them on their journey. Lord, we have people in this room who have been saved for a long time, but they're starting to become a reservoir of God's grace instead of a flowing fountain of God's grace. And so today they need to receive the baptism of the Spirit, the filling of the Spirit, that outpouring where the Holy Spirit takes us to this new level of power, usefulness, our spiritual gifts began to operate. We find our place in the church. We become involved in the Great Commission. And Lord, we're praying that as we studied your word today that each of us realized how important it is that we develop a relationship with the person of the Holy Spirit and we seek to be a channel through whom he works. To that end, Lord, we pray that whatever you did today in our hearts and our lives, you would seal it in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise is rising, eyes are turning to you, we turn to you.
In your presence all our fears are washed away When we see you we find strength to face the day In your presence all our fears are washed away 